What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit, this is your host that's considering the Space Force, and today subreddit is r slash, uh, Tales from the Law, I forgot for a second. Howdy y'all, it's your boy Cowboy Zack. Um, I, I have tuberculosis still, but it ain't deadly this time around in case you missed the joke from the end of that last intro. <sighs> However, I'll try to read the, the title of this story. The Frog Cro- God dang it, tuberculosis, Zack, get out of here! Ah, sorry, he can't read. Um, anyways, this story's called The Crooked Attorney. I was told to post this from r slash pro revenge, and here I am! I am not an attorney, but my boyfriend is, and this tale took place a few years ago in NYC. Thus, here is the tale of Throws Dust and Campfires. It's like a Harry Potter thing. The Crooked Attorney. In looking up this guy's information, he really was a piece of sashimi. A local paper described him as, rewarded for privacy, these con artists are cutthroat and will do anything to get their money. They prey on unsuspecting victims and take out loans and falsify information. They take off with most of the money. The con artists are very skilled and few of them are ever sent to prison. Until my boyfriend came along. My boyfriend, boyfriend, moved to New York City from a state in the South freshly out of law school and riddled with student debt. He found a low-paying personal injury firm and settled in. Since money was tight, he found a roommate on Craigslist named Julie. Julie is a feisty Latina, and my boyfriend is pretty much wonderbred, but they hit it off pretty well. My boyfriend would go to Julie's job after work, she was a bartender, and they developed a very strong friendship. During this time, Julie meets a server, Luis. They hit it off and begin dating. My boyfriend clicks with Luis and they become a trio. Drunken tequila nights, being on the subway platform, my boyfriend being taken to Latin clubs, they become the best of friends. Something that will play a role in this tale is that both Julie and Luis and their families are in the USA undocumented. Please don't turn this into a political post. Yes, please. So Julie and Luis are getting serious, but don't have a lot of money. So they move in with Luis's elderly parents. My boyfriend finds another place to live, and they all still keep in touch. During all of this, Luis's dad had suffered an injury at work. He lost part of his finger and had hired a personal injury attorney, aka piece of sashimi. Apparently, he was supposed to receive a $100,000 settlement but some time had passed and still no update. Julie, since neither Luis or his dad spoke English, called Luis's father's insurance and asked about the status of the settlement. The insurance said, Oh, the settlement's already been paid out. That's when Julie called my boyfriend, freaking out. Apparently, this personal injury attorney had a history of being an ambulance chaser and sought out clients who were here illegally. He held that over them and took their settlement money by forging documents. While there had been reports, the guy had been getting away with fraud for years. So, my boyfriend tells Julie to tell the piece of sashimi that she knows what's up. Apparently, this guy thought his clients were too stupid to seek retribution. Piece of sashimi told Julie that he would return the money if she dropped her complaint against him. My boyfriend was livid at this piece of sashimi taking advantage of immigrants and decided to get payback. He told Julie to record all of her conversations with him and keep records of any type of contact. Apparently, piece of sashimi was using other embezzled funds to hush clients like Julie. Julie met up with him a few times, always recording interactions and getting money from him. With evidence in place, my boyfriend took all the evidence to the New York State Supreme Court, who investigates and told them that he was representing Luis's dad. Apparently, reports had happened for years, but nobody gave a damn until an attorney became involved. It turned out that piece of sashimi had stolen over $400,000 from clients for years. It was a long trial, with my boyfriend representing Luis's dad and he having to testify. Piece of Sashimi knew my boyfriend had reported him and would glare at him from the stand. Long story short, Piece of Sashimi pleaded guilty to charges of identity theft, fraud, grand larceny, etc. He was stripped of his ability to practice law and was sentenced to seven years in jail. 
Luis's dad gave my boyfriend $1,000, he worked pro bono for them, and now my boyfriend is the godfather to Julie and Luis's son. Luis's dad moved back to his native country and bought a beautiful house. All of Pisa Sashimi's victims got their money back through the lawyer's fund for client protection. You know what? That's an amazing ending. Your boyfriend did some good work there. No matter how you fall on this immigration debate, extorting people for money like that is wrong. No matter which angle you you poke with at it with, you look at it. I don't know the... <laughs> Stop. This story's called Not My Problem. Except it kinda is. Useless DNA. Greetings, fellow. Uh, I can't think of a snappy thing for the denizens of this sub, but uh, you people. I had a crappy week last week, and after a much needed relaxing weekend, I'm back, and this time, I figure out how to sneak in a slightly unrelated story about my coworker, who we'll call Moaning Mona, not her real name, I hope not, some background on myself. I am not a lawyer nor do I play one on TV. I am a foreclosure mediation specialist, working for a large mortgage servicer in the United States. That's as specific as I can get without risking getting myself in crap. Prior to doing mediations, I was a team lead for the foreclosure team here. And before that, I was a processor, or foreclosure tech, handled the nitty gritty of the cases, preparing documents, etc. In my company and department, there are two mediation reps, myself and a fairly useless lump of DNA at one of our other offices across the goddamn country. I operate with almost complete autonomy and report directly to my manager. Not to toot my own horn, but I am good at what I do and I work hard. I have, however, convinced my boss that this work is a lot more difficult than anyone knows, so I basically spend my days listening to heavy metal, answering emails, taking phone calls with our attorneys in courts, and trying to put out fires when someone screws up. It's interesting. When I took this job, I was working with another guy who was super lazy, but also really funny and knowledgeable about the field. He was a riot, and we got on well together. A year ago, he transferred to a different department, which meant that we needed to hire a new mediator. Now, our company has multiple campuses across the country, because we're kind of a big deal in our field. It was decided by the powers that be that we should hire a mediator from one of our other facilities in a different time zone. The intention was that they can take the later conferences that sometimes run past regular working hours in my time zone. I was against this for several reasons. One, most of our conferences take place first thing in the morning, so they'll be getting in and leaving right about when I do anyways. Two, part of the job is, or was, being able to talk things out and research difficult cases with my coworker, pull our resources, that sort of thing. More difficult to do that when they're across the damn country. If I'm out sick, or if they're out sick, our department is less centralized. If their phone is ringing all day and not mine, I can't just go pick up their phone if they're in a different state. All those calls will be missed unless the caller has, and chooses to call, my number as well. For reasons that I will never understand, after bringing my concerns to management, the response was basically, ha <laughs> ha, no. So began the hiring process for this new person. Now, my coworker's last day was in late March, and the management team for the other group didn't even start holding interviews until the second week of April. Which meant I was doing 100% of the work for a two-person team with 0% of the assistance. This would continue for a month and a half while the hiring process was going on. A hiring process I was not involved with, by the way. Interviews were being held, and I was able to sit in on some of them, but most of them were scheduled at times where I had hearings I had to be available for. See above, the only person working in the damn department at this time. So, I didn't even get a chance to quiz half of the candidates. I did speak with and did recommend a young lady from that department who I thought would do very well, but only several weeks later did I come to learn that my recommendation was ignored again, and they hired Moaning Mona. Okay, whatever. Now, I can look past a lot. I can look past the fact that her looking forward to working with you email was riddled with spelling errors. 
I can ignore the fact that she is a super chatty Kathy and likes to gossip and gripe about everyone, including me I have no doubt, but what I can't abide is having to repeat myself 30 times trying to train her to do the work. Folks, the basic stuff just wouldn't stick. How to use our calendar program to schedule hearings. What screens and workstations to go to in order to find the information you need, etc. It took her weeks to learn the basic stuff. Very frustrating, but okay, it is what it is. I'm planning on transferring to a different department for various reasons at this point anyway. So we get a case where she's unavailable for the call that morning. I can't remember if she was on a different call or out that day, and I get the call from the attorney to discuss the case. We're talking it over before pulling the court referee in, and I'm going through my regular series of workstations to look out for common red flags, familiarize myself with the loan. I find one. The borrower isn't eligible for a modification because of some technicalities on their loan. I mention as much to the attorney, who goes quiet. Moaning Mona didn't mention this at the last conference. The mediator won't be happy with this. Of course. Of course she didn't. I bet she didn't even look at that workstation. Well, nothing I can do about it now. All we can do is convey the information and hope the mediator takes it in stride. Folks, the mediator did not take it in stride. After being told the borrower was only available for temporary alternatives and not modification, she takes the borrowers out of the room and talks with them privately. When she returns to talk to us privately, she tells us she's very close to referring this for a bad faith finding and sanctions because at no point in the prior conferences was it mentioned the borrower might not be eligible for a modification. And if that information had been presented, then the borrower might not have wasted months of time and legal fees applying for a modification they would never get. The attorney and I attempt to salvage the situation and justify it by saying that we legally have to review the borrower no matter what their potential disqualification is. It just means they can only possibly be approved for temporary options like a forbearance and the mediator considers it, but ultimately will be releasing us from mediation and will be referring this to a judge for review. The judge will make the determination if there was bad faith. I'm pissed, but I didn't do anything wrong, so that's that until the next day when I fill in Mona. At first, she dodged around whether or not she'd seen that information before, or whether it came up in conference. Our attorney and the referee were adamant it hadn't, though. And then, she hit me with this priceless gem. Well, then why did you tell them? I... What? Excuse me? I'm not gonna lie to a mediator and omit information relevant to the borrower's financial review. No way! And I tell her as much. And that the information is useful to the borrower making an informed decision about how to proceed with their attempts to resolve the foreclosure. But we're not underwriters, that's not for us to decide. Well, we're not making a decision. We're not out and out denying the borrower, we're just informing them that they will be denied because of some very basic information. This pisses me off too, because one of the things about her I don't like is that she acts like an underwriter when communicating to our loss mitigation team, bullying them and telling them how they should be doing their job. I stand firm though and tell her that this is information that needs to be brought up. And anyways, it's done now and we'll just have to see what the judge says. That ends the call quickly. The case ended up not being found in bad faith. Fortunately, but that didn't stop her from bringing this situation back up a few weeks later. I can't recall the exact situation, but basically when I said that she should go back to loss mitigation and advise them that we can't do X or Y because of a court order, she snarkily replied, But I thought we were underwriters. How is that different from telling a borrower that they're denied for a program? I shut that crap down immediately and pointed out that advising loss mitigation were under a court order to act is not the same as advising the borrower they will still be reviewed, but that they don't qualify for a particular program. Whew, long one today. Sort of a fringe to the law, but it does involve the courts and our version of disclosure. As a bonus, the thing that put a bee in my bonnet last week. So at the beginning of the year, Mona took a leave of absence. 
I was frustrated by this because I'd be working by myself again. Efforts to hire a temp were met with, surprisingly, <laughs> no, we have someone work half days on some of her work, you can do the rest. And because she told me six weeks and ended up taking eight without telling me, but I digress. For those two months, I made sure all the work was done to the absolute best of my ability. Emails were answered, calls were handled, work was completed. I was a one-man army as far as mediations were concerned. Sure, I was pretty sure I was developing a stress ulcer, but what's a mild stroke now and then among friends? I decided about halfway through that I was taking a freaking vacation the week after she got back. I put in my time, I talked to my boss, and I planned to get some much needed time away. Mona got back and I told her about me going away right away. I made sure our attorneys knew and I even briefed one of our supervisors in case they needed to help cover calls. And I stepped off for a week. I needed it and it was good. The night before I came back, I had a sense of dread come over me. I worried that I would come back and that none of my work would be done or something would literally be on fire. I tried to reason it away. But my gut told me I was walking back into a mess. And folks, let me tell you, I could not have been more right. Not only had none of my workstation work been done, this includes scheduling the goddamn hearings on our calendar, but there were almost 100 emails in our shared email marked unread, in addition to the 250 emails in my box I had to correlate and confirm if they had been responded to. When I went to my boss, she thought I was going to stroke out. I had a terse conversation with Mona about how things had been, where she complained about how busy things had been, and I don't know how you did it, and blah blah blah, to which I gave short, non-committal answers. I later got an inter-office message from her stating she couldn't help but feel like I was upset with her over the amount of work that was left from when I was away, and that she wasn't happy with it either, but insert excuses here. She was gone for two months, and I had that crap locked down solid. I go away for one week, and nothing gets done! I was furious. I didn't talk to her at all that week. Just came in, worked, and left. From what I understand, my boss talked to her boss and her boss basically shrugged and ignored it so nothing is being formally done. Just unbelievable. So that's why she's useless. Thanks for listening to me rant. No problem, your rant was rather entertaining if I'm allowed to say so. And I am, I think I am. Anyways, dude, I am so sorry about that. You're literally on a permanent group assignment. <laughs> That's horrible, and I, I do not envy you, your position there. However, Mona's got it pretty good, I'd say. <laughs> anyway, dude, fantastic story. This was a really good read. Um, I, I appreciate your energy. It helped me find my energy. <laughs> um, and it was good. Good stuff. In fact, I feel like if I were in his position, this would be my post, and it would be pretty much identical. But we went down different paths. You went down the route of uh, mediation and lawyerly stuff, maybe soon to specialize in bird law, potentially. And I went down the route of reading Reddit stories, among other things. Which isn't a bad gig, I like it. However, it does come with the whole, uh, Oh, you got it easy. All you do is read stories online. Well, you know what? Well, you try it. No, seriously, try it out. It's a fun thing to do. Voice acting is really fun, um, but you're going to suck at it at first, okay? I thought I was pretty good when I started, but, you know, I go back and listen to the stuff I did in my very beginning. Blech. Anyways, sorry for the rambling. Just wanted to say, cool bird law story. I really appreciated it, Charlie. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.